Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 71. You want some gravy with that? Welcome to the 71st edition of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we've got Mr. Jeb Blunt, author of six books, a keynote speaker, a trainer, consultant, and the founder of Sales Gravy, salesgravy.com. I've known Jeb for over six years now, and this guy is prolific in his production of content, and he's also a true sales and sales training professional. So along those lines, today's joke is about a young salesman who met his untimely end. Uh, as he gets to pearly gates, he's informed he can have a choice. He can spend all of his time in eternity in either heaven or hell. So he says, well, let me see what heaven looks like there, St. Pete. And he's shown, you know, the puffy clouds and the harps playing and the little angels. Uh, and it's all nice and, and all, but, you know, he's a salesman. He's had a pretty rowdy life. So he says, all right, let me see what hell looks like. And he goes down and he sees the hot tubs and the jacuzzis and the golf courses and the weight rooms and hang out by the pool and everybody's partying and loud music. And St. Peter says, well, which one is it going to be? He says, man, you know, as, as nice and all as, as heaven looked and all I've heard about it, um, you know, I think hell is kind of more my speed. So, all right, St. Peter snaps his fingers, young salesman goes straight to hell, and bam, he is chained to a wall, uh, he is lit on fire, he is beaten and tortured, and he's like, whoa, wait a minute, what is going on here? What happened to the jacuzzis and the parties and the music and the golf courses? And and uh, the devil says, ha. That was just the sales demo. So make sure you are not one of those cheesy, slimy salespeople. And I know you're not because you are listening to the sales podcast. Uh, but there's a little hint of truth in that little joke there, is it not? So before we get into how not to be a cheesy, pushy salesperson, let us recall the sales podcast creed, which is today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits and surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, today will be better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. So without further ado, here is our guest, Mr. Jeb Blunt, founder of Sales Gravy. Jeb Blunt triple author at least owner of salesgravy.com world traveler fellow southerner welcome to the sales podcast how are you i'm doing great wes how are you doing i'm good it's um it has only taken us maybe a year to get you to calm down uh for long enough to get on this podcast so we're gonna talk fast i'm gonna suck everything out of you in one hour you ready I'm ready. That sounds good. All right. So uh, for those that don't know you, would you mind t take a second or two or a minute and, and give us the thumbnail sketch of, of who you are and what makes you tick? Oh, man, what makes me tick? Um, you know, I, 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 it's hard. That's a hard question to answer, um, <laughs> how, you know, who I am and, and what makes me tick. You know, I'm, uh, I guess I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I love sales. It's what I do. I spend most of my time in front of groups talking either about sales or how to coach salespeople and lead salespeople. I worked in corporate America for about 20 years, and I, was, um, I left corporate America as a vice president of sales for a really big comp company and ended up starting my own uh, company called salesgravy.com back in 2006. And today we're the most visited sales website on the planet. We're the largest sales online sales employment website in, in terms of market share. And, um, and now we offer, you know, an entire suite of sales enablement um, products and technologies for automating sales onboarding for sales training. And we just continue to build our little empire, you know, one, one small piece at a time, everything focused on what you know, I've got the most passion for, and that's uh, helping salespeople make more money and closing a whole bunch of business on my own. So what what happened? What happened? I mean, 20 years, you know, we would think, you know, you've arrived, right? You're the VP of sales. You've climbed that corporate ladder. Uh, there's got to be a gold wristwatch in there somewhere for you, probably a big fat 401K, maybe stock options, expense account. And why why do you just leave that behind? Man, that's, that tell you what, that, you're exactly right. A big old expense account. I had a secretary corner office. 
um, you know, everything that you'd want. I mean, it was the, you know, sort of the, it, when you're working for a Fortune 500 company at that level, it is, it's, you're a superstar and everything is handed to you on a platter. And, you know, one day I started my own company and it was, you know, me sitting down in my house in Florida and flip flops, you know, talking to the wall because that was the only secretary that I had. And it was a, it was a, it was a lifestyle choice. You know, the, the reality was that I was really, really good at what I did, and I had had tremendous success with the company that I was with, and I really loved it. I loved the people that I work with. I love my company, and I probably would have been there for the rest of my life with the exception that the company began to change. And what happened was we were a company that really valued you know, productivity. We really valued people who got stuff done. We valued, you know, evaluated or, or, or valued the entrepreneurial spirit. We went public and then we went private and we were bought out by a private equity firm and a whole bunch of outsiders came into a company that had a really tight culture and basically turned everything into um, a place that I guess I didn't want to work. And a whole lot of people that I knew didn't want to work, a lot of a lot of my friends who – all my friends, in fact, were with that company uh, – didn't want to work there. And it just was – for me, I just woke up one day and said, yeah, I just want to do this anymore. I found myself – I, a great example is I just I, I woke up one day and said, you know, I I get on an airplane on Monday mornings, I come home on Fridays, and I spend the entire week in meetings, um, sitting around a table listening to people talk. And I'm the vice president of sales, and I'm getting virtually no time with the salespeople, which is really what I wanted to do. So I was in a position where I could go seek something else, and so I retired. And then 30 days later, my wife said that if I didn't unretire, that she was going to retire. So um, <laughs> I had to uh, I had to find something to do. And you know what? I started I started off by writing a book. I wrote a book called Power Principles. It was my first of six books, and I built SalesGravy.com initially to support the book. And I was a bit naive at the time because I built a website, and it took about three months to figure out that if I didn't do something different, I was going to go broke building the website. And so it, it, in early 2007, the idea of creating salesgravy.com as a destination website that sold employment advertising was hatched, and we started at that point. It took about two years to get profitable. We, we got profitable in 2009, and we've been, we haven't looked back you know, since then. But it was a tough transition, Wes. I mean, you know, there were, I found myself at times, you know, I, I, in fact, I really don't re- remember 2008, 2009, 2010 because I didn't really sleep. I was, you know, I was up all night long. I worked all day long. Um, I didn't have any staff. It was just me. And I was trying to build, you know, a, a website that produced income. I was trying to write books so that I could focus on the future. I had a pretty good vision of where I wanted to be, but the only person that was going to get us there was was me. And uh, it was it was tough. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it, but it was tough. So you didn't roll some big fat stock options into a fancy office with a big staff and just snap your fingers and said, okay, launch this site, write these books, and uh, uh, here's my bank account, deposit all that money for me? (laughs) <laughs> no, I didn't. Now, I did use a bunch of my own money, you know, when I was getting started. <laughs> I did, I, but I never took out a loan. In fact, we are, we are, you know, we're a company that is completely debt-free. Um, we have never grown, you know, bigger than our britches. We've, we probably could have grown a lot faster if we had taken some investment money, you know, a few years ago or if we had borrowed some money to do certain things. But we made a decision, and this is just me. I believe that businesses are, you know, should be, profitable. That's what I, that's why you're in business. If, if you're in business and you're not making a profit, it's a hobby. So I believe that we needed to be profitable. And so we, you know, we, we moved very slowly in the way we did things very systematically and a lot of sweat equity to begin with. And, you know, you're right. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a big staff to do things. You know, I wrote books and called customers and sold stuff and, you know, one of the first big accounts I sold was ADP uh, on Sales Gravy, and that took about a year of just persistent work day in and day out. And I'll tell you, one, one of the things I did early on, you talk about you know, sweat equity, is that I was trying to get people to post their jobs on Sales Gravy. 
So I spent about a year driving around in my car crashing job fairs. So I would go to these job fairs and I would have a bunch of flyers and I would sneak around the job fair and give it to, you know, the different recruiters. And when you talk about getting rejected, I mean, a lot of rejected and I got thrown out, on, you know, tossed out on my head a couple of times. But, you know, that began to build some buzz and I got a few people on and I could connect. And, you know, I just it was just, you know, one little piece at a time. And um, and no, I mean, it was it was very, very, very hard work. There was there's just no other way around it. And, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, what did you do? How'd you do? You know, what, how'd you do it? What special things did you have? And I just look at them and say, you know, it's just hard work. And there's no other way around it. How do you write? You know, I don't know how you get it done. How do you write books? Well, I don't watch TV at night. I work. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, and it was and it was just it was just those, you know, those little pieces that over time, you know, you start repeating those things again and again, you begin to build a profitable business. You know, today we're really profitable. I mean, today we have a bunch of employees. We have just moved into brand new offices. You know my schedule because you watch me. I'm I'm as busy as I've ever been. I, I think last year I spent almost 300 days on the road working with clients. And, you know, that came from those little humble beginnings when one day I said, what do I know how to do? And the only thing I could answer was I know how to sell stuff. So I built Sales Gravy. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I'm going to kick myself for forgetting who said this. And I just read the quote. It may come to me, but they, they had, I, oh, man, I want to say maybe, Napoleon Hill or somebody said, you know, if you follow around an executive, you know, for for a week, you know, at the end, you'll say, well, no wonder he's successful. Look how look at everything that he does. Right. I mean, it's it's no sitting on your butt because you do so much. You are successful. Um, So I love you sharing that and getting down into the nitty gritty. And, you know, and and it's cool that you talk about something anybody listening to this at any level in their business can do. And that is run off some flyers and go crash a chamber of commerce function, a job fair, anything and go go gorilla. Right. That was gorilla marketing, getting the word out uh, very inexpensively. But how, how come more people don't do that? You know, it's it's the um, I always tell a story when I when I first got married, I um, I worked in sales and I was an entry level salesperson and my wife was with me and we had to take her car down to a, a dealership to get it fixed. She had one of those Chrysler Barons. You probably remember the ones that were supposed to be convertibles, but they were hard top. It was the dumbest car they ever made and it was broken all the time. So we had to go down to get it fixed. And at the time I sold industrial uniforms, rental uniforms, not a very sexy thing, but Lots of money in that, a lot of commissions in that. So we, we pulled her car into the to the dealership, and the, uh, walked out there. And the guy walked, the you know the mechanic walked out, and his, he had his name tag on his shirt, and it was just hanging on by a thread. And I I looked at him and said, you know, I can't help but notice that you've got. Uh, you know, your your name tag hanging off your shirt. And he said, oh, you know, those blankety blank uniform company, you know, they're they're terrible, they're horrible, blah, 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 blah. And I said, great. Well, you know, can you introduce me to the person who makes the decision on uniforms? And, you know, how many people do you have in uniform there? And I did this whole qualifying thing with him right there on the spot. And then I realized I brought my wife's, you know, car in and I turned around and she wasn't there. I mean, she had crawled underneath the car. And, um, and when I finally got her out, we talked about the car, we pulled out of the gear. She looked at me on the way out and she said, don't you ever do that to me again. And what she was basically saying is it was really embarrassing for her that I was prospecting. I mean, even though prospecting generated commission checks that bought her shoes and purses, it embarrassed her that I would actually walk up to someone and say, you know, I couldn't help but notice, but, and I think that for so many people, they they internalize prospecting or you know asking questions or you know handing out a business card they see that as some embarrassing cheesy thing that you do but it's the key to just about everything you know it's taking action it's um it's i i used to you know in the early days i'd crash job fairs i also went to i, I would actually sign up and go to all of these big trade shows because the trade shows were full of salespeople. And I'd walk around to the trade show booths and I would pick up business cards and introduce myself to salespeople and talk about my books and, you know, talk about sales gravy. And I, I would generate traffic the old fashioned way, which was to go out there and, 
and, and talk to these folks. Well, I had one of my people with me one time, one of my early employees, and said, this is what we're going to do. And it, the look on, on his face was fear. <laughs> you know, I'm just gonna, we're just going to walk up to people and talk to them? I go, yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, the thing about websites is there's no such thing as build it and they will come. You have to go create traffic. And, you know, there's, there's, the, there's hard ways and easy ways. My constituency was salespeople. I had to go get in front of them. And so I think that, I think that you know, people are, people are just afraid of those things. I, I don't know if you ever saw the, the video. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk did this video where it was a prospecting video. It was the coolest thing ever. And he was talking about prospecting and he was just, he just got on the web and he said, you know, if you wanted to sell beer services or something, you would go on the web, find the company, reach out, call them and ask them to, you know, buy advertising or do whatever, you know, and he, and he gets on the phone and he just does it. Right. So, you know, it's, it's what you have to do. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business person, if you are, um, you know, if you're in sales, you got to prospect like crazy. In fact, I, I teach a course called Fanatical Prospecting around that, you know, that uh, that concept. But uh, tell me if there's another way to build a business other than going out there and finding a customer base and bringing them in. I, I haven't found the magic pill yet. Oh, Jeb, that's so old school. That's so 90s. Prospecting doesn't work. Cold calling doesn't work. It's all social media today, man. <laughs> you know, if, if, I lived on, if I lived on that dream that cold calling doesn't work, we would be broke. I, you know, I have, every day I have a, I mean, my, my salespeople get on them in the morning, they get on the telephones, and we call people up. You know, we do inbound marketing. We do tons of social media. You know that. You see us out there. We, we do a massive amount of social media. Even I think in Forbes, I got written up as one of the top 30, you know, so I think you were in that list too, social selling people. I mean, you know, I get all that stuff, and it's, it's important that you're doing all of the above. You know, there is a, there's a thing about prospecting that is kind of like investing. You wouldn't put all your investment money in one, you know, in one investment, nor should you put all your prospecting effort in one thing like social media. And I've definitely watched salespeople spend an entire day on LinkedIn and get nothing done. In fact, not too long ago, my salespeople telling me how social media was the way that my way was old school. And I said, okay, you prospect on LinkedIn. I'm going to get on the telephone. At the end of the day, I sold five pieces of business. And he said that a couple of people connected to him is really excited about that. <laughs> I'm, I, I like to get a paycheck. So I figure picking up the phone and calling somebody and asking them to do business with me is a better thing than trying to get people to connect with me. Is that important? Yeah, absolutely it's important. Does cold calling work? It does work. Does, you know, does warm calling work? Yep, it works. Does referrals work? Yeah, it works. Networking work? Yeah, it works. Inbound marketing? Yeah, it works. All of those things work. And what I found is that if you balance yourself across those things, you're going to be way more successful than if you, and I love what you said, this old school, you know, old school, new school. And Wes, you know, I got news for you. There is no old school. There is no new school. In sales, there is the school. And the school <laughs> has always worked for the best salespeople. So let's, let's go back to those, those five pieces of business you closed. Can you walk us through those? Were, were they purely cold calls? Were, you, were they add-on sales? Did you already have a list and you were just reaching out? How I mean, did you generate those sales that day? I, those sales just came off of a list. I mean, it was a list that we had of VPs of sales. So I, I called up, quick qualifying question, are you hiring salespeople? If the answer is no, click move to the next one. If the answer is yes, then, you know, jump into a couple of questions. You know, what's going on? Are you struggling with that? What are your challenges? You know, it's the same issue that we, you know, I know that when I was in the uniform business, if you walk into a company, most of the people who wear uniforms are mad. I know that most VPs of sales and sales managers are struggling to hire salespeople. So easy question, engage them, um, find out what's important to them, and then bridge. Or just basically, you know, bridge from what their problems are, their unique problems are, to our solution and articulate it in their language, not ours, and then ask them to buy. So, um, you know, we also have inbound leads where, I mean, inbound leads are fantastic. I'd, I'd love to, you know, to generate 
enough inbound leads to feed every salesperson, but I can't. So a lot of it's just reaching out. And I'm not like, you know, I'm like any other business over time, you know, we've built a good database of VPs of sales and, you know, and, um, and companies that, that buy, you know, employment services and HR people. So we can easily every day get into our database and call people that are in our demographic or, you know, in our, in our sector and find out what they're doing. Are they hiring people or what have you? And then we generate, you know, 10, 20 good leads every single day of people who come into us. Those are, if they're coming to you, much easier to convert, um, but only if you call them right back. And, uh, and that's, I mean, that's what we do. I, I wish I could make it sound sexier than that, but it really isn't. Right. Yeah, but you know what? Closing sales is sexy. <laughs> Closing sales is sexy, but you got to make the phone call first. <laughs> I mean, everybody wants to close the sale. Nobody wants to make the phone call. I know. That's unbelievable. So what are you seeing today? Um, if if you were to start all over again uh, in launching your business, you, you know, some might say, oh, those times were different. 2006, things were booming. But then again, you... You built it through the Great Recession of 2008. Um, you know, if somebody, you know, let's look at two things. One, for the, the current employed salesperson, you know, I want to kind of dive in. What, what should they do better? But I also want to look at the entrepreneur that's maybe in, in your shoes, you know, eight years ago and is considering leaving corporate America to do their own thing. You know, what, would you do anything different uh, or, or follow the same path? Oh, you know, 2020 visions, you know, hindsight's really uh, easy. I would have spent a lot less money than I did. I mean, I made so many mistakes, Wes. I, I just, it's hard for me to look back sometimes and think about how many experiments and how many mistakes I made and how many times I jumped into, you know, some, you know, some idea, this is the way I'm going to, you know, this is the path I'm going to go down. So it's, you know, it's hard to say, it's so easy to look back and say, I wouldn't have made those mistakes. I can tell you that, you know, if I had, if I could start all over again, the one thing that I would have paid more attention to from the very get go with my website, and I don't think that it's, I don't think that most people can start a business without, you know, an online presence anymore. So no matter what you're starting, whether it's a flower shop or you want to build an online business, um, you have to pay attention to search engine optimization. And early on, because I didn't know anything about websites, I mean, literally, I picked up a book and read, and I read stuff online. I found a couple of people to help me. I mean, today I've got a machine. I've got, you know, programmers. I've got a, an entire group of people that every night they're working on and building on the website. But back then, I didn't have that. And we really didn't pay attention to SEO until it was too late. And we had to spend a lot of money to retrofit, you know, our, our online footprint. And that... That has uh, cost me a bunch of money in in terms of you know marketing and the things I the, you know pay per click advertising and things we have to buy, and so you know I, the, that would be one piece of advice I would give to a person starting their business. The, the other piece of advice I would give most people that are looking in the corporate world and looking outside and saying I want to own my own company is keep your day job. The, you know, the, and I, people come to me all the time and say, I want to start my own business. What should I do? Now, I was fortunate in that I spent 20 years with a company and I invested almost everything I made. I lived a pretty austere lifestyle. So I wasn't living beyond my means and still don't live beyond my means. And, um, and so I, I, I had the, the ability to build it, my business in a way that was, again, no debt. I didn't overspend. I was lean. I was able to work lean, act lean. And I've heard you say the same things and feed my family and, and operate in a way that made, you know, that made sense. Uh, most people who work in corporate America, unfortunately, are a little over leveraged and mostly because that's what corporate America wants people to be. If you're hungry because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses, you're a much better employee than if you're me and everything in my life is paid for. So what I would suggest if you do what you would want to do in, in corporate America is decide what you want to do. You're going to have to go to work in the morning. You're going to have to come home at night. You're going to have to eat you know, dinner with your family. And then you have to go to work again, go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, get four hours of sleep, you know, rinse and repeat. And you have to do that over and over and over again until you can get to a place where – you know, your income begins, you know, outstripping, um, you know, your expenses. And I think that the other thing that you want to do is if you're in a place where you feel like, hey, I really want to go be an entrepreneur and build my own business, 
you have to you got to get your lifestyle set up around it so that you're not desperate i mean if you're if you jump out if you you know if you if you've got a huge mortgage and all these car payments and credit cards and all this other stuff uh, you you you're, you're it's really really hard to be able to build a business and not living in daily fear and in total desperation and it's tough when you're in fear because i mean you st- you stink. You smell like you smell like you're desperate. And if you smell like you're desperate, you're not going to get any customers. Yep. So, I mean, those are those are a couple of pieces of advice. And um, and the other thing is, you know, because I I got interviewed, I think by Entrepreneur Magazine, Entrepreneur.com recently, and they asked me what my fallback plan was, and I said I didn't have one. It was succeed or fail. Period. There was no fallback plan. What I did was basically when I decided to be an entrepreneur, the day I decided to be an entrepreneur, I became unemployable in corporate America. Because corporate America doesn't want guys like me. I mean, I was look, I was a corporate guy for all those years, but they don't want people like me working in their organization because I don't look good to them. And anybody that would go out and try to be independent of the corporation just doesn't fit the mold. And so your resume comes in. You no longer are someone that's there. So the day I decided to do that, I basically was in a situation where I could never go back to where I was before, period. Right. And I... And I believe in that. I mean, I think that if you believe enough in yourself and believe in what you're doing, you know, burn the bridges and and go figure out how to make it work. It'll sure as heck make you work harder. Yep. A friend of mine posted a picture and said, I, I stand on the bridges that I burn so people know I'm a special kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and she is kind of crazy, but that's oh. why I love her. Um, so what, what are some things that, that work today for salespeople? You know, let's, let's say they're, they're in sales, banging out the phones or they're launching their own business and banging out the phones. Uh, I loved how simple your opening was, you know, Hey, are you hiring salespeople? Uh, is that the advice you still give today? I mean, keep it simple, open with an obvious question and, and, uh, get a yes or a no. So you can, so you can disqualify quickly and move on. Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. So if you are, let's, let's say you work for a big company, and I worked for a big company for a long time, and people knew who we were, and my big company provided me with a database of, of companies that bought our type of services. So it wasn't like I was you know, walking down the street trying to find leads. And, and if you work for a big company, the reality is, is that you, you likely have that type of a database. What I was most, mostly doing was – in my case, qualifying for contract X dates. So because the people that I sold to would have a contract with another provider, uh, I had to make sure that I was getting in, door, in the door at the right time because otherwise I could waste, waste a lot of time with someone who was under contract. So a lot of my qualifying was early on, when's your contract up, when's your contract up, when's your contract up. Once I knew when the contract was up, then I would call the set the appointment. I would call up and say, you know, Wes, your contract's coming up in three months. Um, I want to come by, sit down with you, understand what's going on, and um, so we can get into the, you know, into the mix when you guys, you know, do your next contract extension or consideration. So a really simple question, but there was no reason to to, to be there any time, you know, earlier than that. Sure. And my business is really simple. There's no contracts. It's typically, you know, a transactional type thing. And it's real simple for us. If people aren't hiring salespeople, it's a waste of our time. Why have the conversation? So we just ask that simple question. So I would say that if you work in, a, in an, you know, an industry like mine or you're providing a service like mine, which is someone buying a job post to put on sales gravy, then it's a pretty – if you can find a simple question like that, ask that question. And we pick that up, by the way, working at trade shows. We go to trade show, people walk by the trade show booth. We'd ask the question, are you hiring salespeople? If they said no, we'd let them walk. If they said yes, we would get them in. We'd have a little putting game. We'd play golf with them. We'd talk to them. We'd, but we'd qualify them at that point. Um, if you work for a small company or you're an entrepreneur you know, and you're calling people up, you, know, you may have a different set of questions that you might ask. I mean, typically when I'm dialing the phone, I know that I'm interrupting someone's day. So all I want to know is what I'm asking for. I'm either gathering information so I can qualify. 
I'm going to set an appointment with you so that I can do a demo. I can come out and meet you and in the, in the training world. So my training and consulting, a lot of times we're setting appointments to go to someone's office and spend time with them and understand their, you know, their, their particular circumstances for either onboarding salespeople or training salespeople or, you know, optimizing their sales organization. So those, that would be an appointment. Or if it's a transactional type sale, you can just call up and close them over the telephone. It depends on it depends on what you're selling. It depends on if it's B to B or B to C. But the reality is exactly what you said. It's usually something really simple. What I find more often than not is that some marketing person who has never sold anything in their entire life comes up with a four page script for salespeople to use. It sounds like you know something horrible. The salesperson is calling up, interrupting someone's day, and going through this script, and it's it's a bad experience for them and for the person they're calling. What I try to do is get on and off the phone as quickly as possible, which is respectful for the person's time that, you know, that I'm, you know, the person I'm reaching out to is respectful for their time because I am interrupting their day. And I want to know what my objective is and I want to ask for it. I mean, honestly, if you simplify it all, ask for what you want. Call them up and ask for what you want. You're either going to get a yes, no, or maybe. And when that happens, you can deal with everything else from there. Uh, I think a little hidden gem in there, though, is you have it scripted. So you're not necessarily against scripts. You're just against bad scripts. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I call it, I use a simple sales script. It's, you know, get their attention. The fast, best way to get their attention is say their name, you know, tell them why you're calling. I mean, excuse me, or introduce yourself. So my name's Jeb with salesgrippy.com. The reason I'm calling is I want to find out if you're hiring salespeople. And uh, so are you hiring salespeople? Yeah, I am. Great. You know, this is what we do for companies like yours. Can you tell me a little bit about some of your struggles with sales hiring? They're talking. I'm listening. They keep talking. I keep listening. I'm going to have an opportunity to bridge the gap and offer them something that will solve their problem. So it's, you know, it's um, get their attention. Tell them who you are. Tell them what you want. Tell them why they should pay attention to you. And then ask for what you want. Yeah, but Jeb, you sell something exciting. Everybody needs better salespeople. But, you know, I sell transmission fluid. This is so boring. I can't use a script like that. Dude, I sold <laughs> I sold industrial uniforms using a script like that and set, you know, 100-year, I'm not kidding, 100-year sales records in my company using a script like that. And uniforms are about as boring as it gets. And I will tell you something about employment advertising. It is, I thought uniform sales was hard. Employment advertising is about the hardest job, hardest thing you can possibly sell. It is, it is a brutal thing to sell. There are about 40,000 other companies out there selling the same exact thing. And, uh, and you, and, and you have to, you, you gotta, you know, you're talking to people that get, you know, dozens and dozens of calls all day long and you've got to somehow, you know, break through. And get their attention. I mean, and I, and I, and there is no magic fairy dust that makes that happen. There is no magic pill. There are no scripts. And, you know, and, and the, 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 the experts and authors, and I'm going to say this is going to sound kind of ugly, that pander to, to fear by telling people that they're going to be able to make prospecting calls or cold calls without pain or that they can eliminate rejection or they can make it easier are just full of crap and they're selling a load of goods to a bunch of salespeople who don't really want to make the calls in the first place because, you know, honestly, I'm really good at it, but prospecting still sucks. I'd rather go close business. I'd rather go make presentations, but I have to prospect in order to get myself in position to win. So, so there, there is, there is nothing. And, and if the people that are listening to, to me, hear me, there is nothing that is going to make prospecting easier, less painful, more palpable. It's not going to make that make anything change. Now, can you get more effective? Yes. Can you get more efficient? Efficient means that you can get more done in less time prospecting. And that's where really I, I want to be. I want to try to get more done in less time. And can you be more effective? In other words, get, you know, in, increase or improve the results that you get from the time that you are prospecting. Absolutely. And a lot of these experts offer really good tools for that. But if somebody tells you that they're going to eliminate rejection, run the other way as fast as you can because there is no such thing. Yep. But, Jeb, you have good hair. You have a red tie. You're just a born natural salesperson. This comes so easy to you. I could never be good at sales. 
<laughs> Man, you know, um, that's funny. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, when people ask me, you know, and people say stuff like that to me, really. And I go, you know, I'm a really terrible salesperson. I, I've never been that great. I don't fit in any of the models or the molds or anything like that. My uh, my sell swing is sort of like uh, Baba Watson's golf swing. I mean, no, I don't think anybody could reproduce it. And I do teach people how, I do teach people how to sell the classic way. And I I spend a lot of time around emotional intelligence and you know how you how you really are able to connect with buyers, how you can how you can ask better questions, how you can build better bridges, how you can articulate things in their language, how you can become a trusted advisor. I do teach that, and I do practice those skills. Uh, however. You know, I've got one mantra that I live by every day, and it's the one thing that, you know, I, I, and I've sold millions and millions of dollars for this stuff, and I've made millions and millions of dollars selling stuff. And my mantra is this. Nobody will ever out-hustle me ever. Nobody will ever outwork me ever. I may not be the best salesperson, and I guarantee you that I'm not. And I may not have the best product knowledge. I guarantee you I'm not. I don't have the most money. I don't have the slickest website. I don't have the coolest toys. I don't have any of those things because I, I build slow, and I build with cash I have today versus borrowing money tomorrow. I've had at least a dozen companies since I started Sales Gravy in the middle of a recession come up against me with big-time VC capital, and every single one of those companies has failed. Because not a single person in those companies would ever be able to outwork me, ever. And, 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 and I know that, again, that sounds old school, but it's the truth. And, uh, and, I, and I can you know, go to bed at night, lay my head down on the pillow, and I know that I'll wake up tomorrow morning, and when I start running, you know, by the end of the day, most people will be tired out, and I'm still going to be going. And, and that's, that's how I win. So... Can that fire in the belly be created or, I mean, uh, do you have to have at least the embers there that can get stoked into this big roaring flame that, that drives you to, to work that hard? I, you know, that's a great question. I think that there is a certain natural drive that people have. And I do believe that, you know, if you're not born with that drive or you can't find something that you, that you that that you like to do that you know that that gets you hungry to wake up every single morning. I, I don't know that you can get there. And I'm not talking, by the way, about a product or service. I mean, honestly, you know, selling employment advertising is a really hard way to make a living. Um, I like what I do. I love who we touch. I love the processes that we build. I like those things, but tough. And I don't I don't necessarily subscribe to people need to love their product in order to be successful. I do think you kind of need to love selling or love being an entrepreneur or love being a podcast host or, you know, or love helping people with inbound marketing, you know, one of the things that you do so well. That's so what I think that I think that you 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 have to find something about what you like. So I think some of it's an innate drive. However, I also think that you can you can cultivate this drive and it's going to sound a little bit weird and maybe I sound a little, you know, like a little Zen-ish here, but I think that it, I think cultivating gratitude is one of the keys to cultivating that inner drive, those, like those embers. I see so many people today that are just, I don't know how you would say this, but couched, I guess, in, in entitlement. They, they, they whine and complain about what they don't have. They, I, I meet salespeople who complain to me because, you know, their company won't listen to them or, or their prices are too high or their boss doesn't pay attention to them or whatever the case may be. And I look at him and I go, you know, look around you, look at the unemployment in the world, look at all of the people who are struggling and you work for a company that's paying you $75,000 a year plus commission to sell their stuff. And they give you a company car and you got a phone and you got a computer and you got a CRM program and you can go out there and knock on doors and you can, if you really work hard and follow the system that they've been, they've given you, you can make two hundred to fifty thousand dollars And some people can make even more of that. And you're whining to me because you don't have enough. You know, that to me, that, that, that entitlement, that, um, that, complaining to me that's the thing that extinguishes the embers of drive the opposite of that is gratitude when people when people look around themselves and they say they're you know look at the opportunity that i have um look at the look what i've been given 
if you're right out of college and you've jumped into a company entry level. When I started at my company that I spent almost 20 years with, I started driving a truck, Wes. You know, I was 24 years old. When I was 34 years old, I was vice president. Think about that. But I started driving a truck. People are complaining about driving trucks or doing an entry-level job, but all of a sudden, you're in the stream. Now all you got to do is start swimming. Look at the opportunity you've been given. They let you in the front door. What can you make of that? When you look around and you see gratitude, you see you're thankful, you, you see the opportunity, I think you can, I think you can not only you know, ignite the embers, but you can stoke the flame. And if you want a great example of what gratitude sounds like and, and, and how it's such an important part of character, all you got to do is just hop on YouTube and go watch Kevin Durant's MVP acceptance speech. Right. I, I've watched it over and over and over again because that is a man who, who will continue to be great, not because he's really, really talented, and yes, he is, but there's tons of people who are really talented who never reach that level of greatness He's great, and he will continue to be great, and you'll see so many more amazing things come into his life because he stokes his drive and his fire with gratitude and thankfulness for everything he's been given. Yep. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, that is great advice. Um, so let me ask you about your books. I, uh, you mentioned six. I see Power Principles, your sales guy's seven rules for outselling the recession, uh, and then your people love you, people buy you, people follow you series. What am I missing? Um, the Business Expert Guide to Small Business Success. Uh, they co-authored that book with uh, Lee Sauls. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I'll, I'll look that one up make sure we link to it. Um, so why, why so many books? It's a lot of stuff to write about. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working on four more right now, and I'm writing them all at the same time. So I'll have a new book out in the fall. Um, I think that I think writing is um, I think writing is important. I think it's important for for most people. I have gotten better at it as I've gone along. Um, you know, I when I wrote Power Principles, I sometimes go back and read Power Principles, and that book that that. You know, that book sold tons of copies and that got me into some of the larger publishers who then, you know, actually wrote me big checks to write books. But I look back then and I go, wow, that was just really bad, poor writing compared to how I write now. And so it's continuing to build the craft and get better and better at it. But, you know, it's um, it's also part of business. You know, a book gets you attention. A book gets you indoors. I have several major clients that I work with that came to me because someone picked up my book in an airport or someone gave them, you know, an executive, my book. And so a book is a book is great marketing. And it's the, it's easy because when someone reads a book and they like it, they come to you and that's a whole lot easier than going to them. So, and it, it makes me feel good. I like, I like doing it. When I produce a book, I feel great. The flip side of that, though, Wes, you know, when you write a book is that, um, you know, it's it causes a tremendous amount of stress because you don't want it to fail. Um, you're going to get picked on. People are going to criticize you. You're going to get poor reviews. And some of them are, you know, are personal attacks that that make no sense. And you're going to get rejection and you're going to, the worst thing is, you know, you write a book and you've, you've, um, you've been through it a million times. You've had editors go through it a million times and you find an egregious typo right in the middle of the book after it's been published. That hurts too. So there's the, there's the yin and the yang. There's the, there's the pleasure and the pain that comes with, with writing. And, um, it's, I, I feel compelled to do it. I don't really have, you know, any other answer. I know that, I just got to keep writing. What would you say to somebody that doesn't have a book right now? Would you would you encourage them to self publish uh, or go through the more traditional route? Oh, I, I you know I, there's so many self publishing opportunities. You know, we started a um, a uh, a publishing company back in 2007, and we published I think 42 books from various authors. We have a couple of more that we have out there now, but we were publishing books as a traditional publisher because so many authors were having a hard time getting into the big guys. So if you, if you want to write a book and I encourage you to write a book, I think that I really believe that every single human being has something to say, and you may write a book and nobody will ever read it, but you and your mama, 
but you should, um, you should, you know, you should write it and you should get it out and you should practice that. It's a, it's a cathartic thing that really means something. And, and so few people will ever do that. If you, if you, if nobody knows who you are, and you have no presence online, um, you're not going to get a big publisher to pay attention to you. There's just not enough money in it. And the, the big publishers are in a lot of stress right now because of Amazon and Kindle and CreateSpace and guys like me that can start small publishing companies that they're only focusing on people that they know can sell a ton of books. So if you don't have a presence, then you probably don't need a traditional publisher. If you do have a great presence, then you know, then you can get a traditional publisher and you just have to decide why you want a traditional publisher. There is definitely some legitimacy that you get from that. There is definitely, you know, an opportunity to get books distributed and um, in some in, in the more traditional ways, although that's disappearing rapidly with digital publishing. So there are some benefits. You just need to weigh those together, because if you really have a great big presence, um, you can publish your book and you can do your audio book and you can do your digital book and you can do all of that without a traditional publisher, you know, with a couple of, you know, a couple of clicks of the mouse. Right. Uh, now, if you don't have if you don't have a presence and you're trying to get out there, then your only option is to self-publish. And there there used to be a massive stigma to self-publishing that is waning just a bit, although it's still there. But it's your it's truly your only option. So the best thing to do, as I, we said earlier, is get into the stream. Write your book, get it out there, self-publish it, and then work your tail off to get people to buy it, get attention on it, use it to build your presence, use it to build your online presence, use it as a, um, as a calling card in your business, um, you know, do all of, those, you know, all of those things that you have to do. Selling a book is really, really hard. In fact, it's almost impossible. So don't be, don't be discouraged if you don't sell tons of copies of it. But do it and then and then start working on the next one and start working on the next one. And the way it worked for me, Wes, is that, you know, I published Power Principles. Um, that was a self-published book. I, I start, set up my own imprint, which um, which we then built into Sales Gravy Press, and which we still have, has, have it as an imprint. And we have, you know, traditional publishing capabilities and distribution capabilities. But I started there, and I went out and sold the stew out of that book. And I pushed it, and I started a podcast and my website and speaking and staying in front of anybody, anywhere. And then one day my phone rang, and it was Macmillan, and we did, um, we did seven rules, and that, that did well. And then John Wally and his son um, called me. Lauren, my, my editor at the time, called up and said, you know, we're, we've been watching you. We would like to do a project with you. And, and that's when we did People Buy You, which was – which was the project that I was sort of holding out for to, for the right time. And it's been, you know, a huge success for us, but that's, that's how it worked for me. But then that was, you know, hours and hours of work. I wrote about a hundred articles. I produced a podcast every single week. And, you know, the way I produce a podcast, I'm actually in my studio right now. It takes me about three hours to produce a five minute podcast, but that podcast has been tremendously successful. We've had uh, almost 7 million downloads since 2007. And, you know, and I did that and I crashed job fairs and I crashed, you know, I crashed um, <laughs> trade shows. And, you know, and when people called up and said, will you speak? I, you know, if they were if, you know, if I could get there, I would. And, um, you know, continued to build the website. And I just I plugged away at it every single day. That's that's my story. There was no there was no magic. There was nothing that was um, that was great. I can't even tell you that, you know that power principles was the greatest book in the world. I just I hustled enough copies to the right people that it, I, I got, I got attention and, you know, but I, you know, I wrote, I published my last book um, last year about this time. And, you know, it's not about what you've done. It's what you've done today. So I got to, I'm working right now on, you know, my next major project that'll be out this, you know, the, the end of this year. Well, that is fantastic. I, I think we'll leave them with that, that uh, it's not what you've done is what you've done today. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, um, what's the what, best way for people to reach you? I mentioned salesgravy.com, and then your, your Twitter handle is salesgravy, right? 
Yep, at Sells Gravy is my Twitter handle. Reach me on LinkedIn. I love people to connect me on Facebook. Um, I do warn you that, you know, I take pictures of food and, and you know, post the occasional <laughs> cat video on Facebook. Facebook's not really that much of a business thing for me. Um, you, can, uh, you can also, my email address is jab at sellsgravy.com. So all the spammers out there, now you know how to get in touch with me. But if you want to send me a note or what have you, you can reach me there. And, um, and, I, and you know, we, you can also um, download the new Sales Gravy iPhone apps. So if you have an iPhone, download that and you can find me there. And you can also, while you're, you know, you're, while you're subscribing to this awesome podcast that I listen to all the time, Wes, because it's fantastic. Um, but while you're subscribing to this, you can uh, subscribe to me on my podcast as well on, uh, on iTunes and catch me there. Yep, I'll have a, a link to that uh, on the Sales Gravy podcast. We'll link to that. Uh, as well, and, and I'll have that in the uh, in the show notes. So, uh, but I warn everybody: if you follow Jeb on Facebook, you will be exhausted just reading about his travels. I, I don't know how you physically do it, but it's uh, it's inspiring. Although I like being home with the kids, so I don't know if I'll travel as much as you until they're grown. <laughs> you got you have a lot more kids than me. So. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know how you do it. You know, I'm on the road, and I, I look at uh, I look at you, and um, and what do you got? Seven kids? Is that right? Yeah, just had seven. Seven, seven kids. You have seven kids, and I think how you 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 say you're exhausting. To I think I've been to Russia five times this year. You say that's exhausting, but um, but uh, seven kids. That's exhausting. In fact, actually, I've been so exhausted lately. Lately, I haven't actually been posting where I've been on sales on uh, on Facebook because I've, it's just been, I've been too tired to even do that. But <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, no, I think uh, I, I would love to have people follow me on Facebook and see where I am. Where's Jeb? They like that. All right. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you. You were certainly worth the wait and the scheduling. So I uh, appreciate you sharing your words of wisdom. And uh, I wish you continued success. Well, thank you very much, Wes. I hope we get to do this again. Thank you so much. All right, man. Thanks, Jeb. Yes, sir. What a great story, huh? There Jeb was, you know, supposedly, you know, obviously a success by the outsider's point of view. He was you know, a VP of sales. He had climbed the corporate ladder, um, but he still wasn't satisfied. You know, retired at an early age, but is like, no way. You know, his wife kicked him out. You know, go unretire after just a month. Uh, so he wrote a book and he launched his website. But go back and listen to that. You know, he didn't sleep for two and a half, three years. You know, it was no staff. It was just him launching the site, writing books. Uh, but he, he bootstrapped it, right? He grew without debt. He grew without outside investments. Uh, he grew systematically. So as he went to get sponsors for his website, it took a year to get ADP to be a sponsor. So this was a very successful salesperson, uh, manager, executive, and it still took that type of persistence and focused effort to make it work. So, you know, if your venture is not yet as big or successful as you, you hope it to be, as your goal, you know, is to make it relax, you know, do you believe in your goal enough to do what it takes to stick with it, you know, to persevere, uh, to make it grow, uh, to bring it to fruition, uh, and most people don't, you know, so showing up and, and persistence uh, and perspiration is 80, 90, 95 percent uh, of success. That's why you see so many people still out of work, still struggling. Uh, they think they can just fire off a, a resume, you know, to via email and, and get the job of their dreams. And, you know, it's just not happening. So uh, society, the world still rewards uh, those with the stick to it. Is that a long word? probably, uh, willing to stick it out. Okay. So you've got to have that fire in the belly. Like, like Jeb talks about, um, have a attitude of gratitude, you know, that he mentioned, um, and, you know, go back. Like I always say, listen to this over and over, go get Jeb's books, read them. Um, if you don't have the money right now, if you're not a good reader, listen to his podcast and the sales gravy podcast, there's tons of free resources like this, you know, so you're in the right place. You're doing the right things. So continue to listen, but take notes and implement at least one thing, just one thing really from everything you listen to, everything you read. If you can do that, you'll be so far ahead of the game. Uh, it'll be insane. Um, so as always, you know, I thank you for listening. I've got two resources for you right now. I'm rolling out the Art of the Close. It's a seven-week uh, live sales training program. It'll be recorded. Uh, if you visit theartoftheclose.guru, 
Uh, you can learn more about it. And uh, that kicks off June 17th, so it's kind of short notice here for this. Um, but even if you come in late, they will be archived and you can access it. And then I'll be teaching it again later in 2014. Uh, so make sure and put that on your calendar. Um, as another program that I offer that is already created, uh, if that's how you like to consume your data, check out 30daysalesgrowth.com. Enter promo code podcast and save $30 on that. Uh, as always, I thank you for listening. Please share the love, a little iTunes rating, a little comment on the blog uh, to help this grow. The more we grow, the more people we can help for free, which is a good thing. Um, thanks for listening, and remember to sound different. Mm-hmm.